أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن نبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله المصطفى الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome to another episode of our tafsir page by page and inshallah ta'ala today we are on page number 62 which is the first page of the fourth juz of the Quran Surah Ali Imran in the previous episode, we mentioned verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the importance of following this religion and that no religion other than the religion of Islam will be acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that those people who know that this is the truth or who reject this as being the truth or follow a way other than the path of Islam, it will not be accepted from them. And unless they make tawbah to Allah azza wa and repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by accepting this religion, then they will have the curse of Allah azza wa upon them and they will have the severe risk of punishments and torments, and no one will be able to come to their aid and their help. In fact, Allah Azza wa as you remember, told us that the people of disbelief, once they die and leave this world, would love to have the amount of gold that fills this world, this earth, to give it away in ransom in order to save themselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that will be a wish and a dream that cannot and will not be fulfilled. In the final verse, of the episode that we took last time, Allah Azawajal then told us that for the believers, we should be people of sadaqa, people who give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that the best form and the highest form of piety, true piety and true righteousness, is not only to give in sadaqa, but to give from the best of your wealth and from the best of that which you which you have. Today we begin with verse number 93 from Surah Ali Imran, and that is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم كل الطعام كان حلا لبني إسرائيل إلا ما حرم إسرائيل على نفسه من قبل أن تنزل التوراة قل فأتوا بالتوراة فاتلوها إن كنتم صادقين Except for what Israel made a lawful for himself all food was lawful to the children of Israel before the Torah was, was revealed. Say, bring the Torah and read out the relevant passage if you are indeed telling the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this particular verse, he mentions an issue that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had with the Jews of Arabia. And that is that the Jewish people would come and they would say, we don't believe that you are a prophet and messenger of God. And one of the reasons why we don't believe that is because in our religion, we don't believe that a prophet can come and abrogate the rulings of a prophet that came before him. Because the Prophet ﷺ is coming with a different sharia to the sharia of Musa salam. The Quran contains different rulings to the rulings that they find in the Torah. So the Prophet ﷺ would say to them that I am the last in the line of the messengers. And yes, Musa salam was a messenger of Allah and our central call is one which is Tawheed. But in terms of rulings and ahkam and so on and so forth, there are differences and changes. I have abrogated the laws of and the sharia of Musa salatu salam. They would say, no, that's not possible. We don't believe that a prophet, if you're all from God, why would one prophet change what is from God to another prophet? And so this was their evidence for this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially refutes this here within this verse in Surah to Ali Imran. And he gives the example of Israel. Israel is another name for Ya'qub alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet of Allah azza wa jal. So we know that Ya'qub was the son of the Prophet of Allah Ishaq and the grandson of the Prophet of Allah Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. The Jews and the Christians, the people of Bani Israel, they trace their line of prophets through the line of Ishaq and Ya'qub. And so they go back to Ibrahim alayhi salam through Ya'qub and Ishaq, back to Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Ya'qub alayhi salam in the Quran is given two names. Number one is Ya'qub, which is his actual name. And number two is the title that he was known by, and that is Israel. And Israel, it is said, means, uh, it is a non-Arabic word, but it means, Isr means a covenant, and Il is the word for Allah azza wa jal, or the name for God. So he was someone who entered into a 
covenant with God, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he was known as Israel. We know that Yaqub alayhi salam has a number of sons. From those sons, you get the tribes of Israel. And that is why they are called the children of Israel, Bani Israel. Israel being the Prophet Yaqub alayhi salatu was salam. So here Allah azza wa says, except for Israel made a lawful for himself, Israel made a lawful for himself, meaning Yaqub alayhi salam made a lawful for himself, all food was lawful to the children of Israel before the Torah was revealed. So Allah is saying that you're saying in your religion there's no abrogation. Every prophet that comes doesn't and cannot abrogate what came before them as prophets. You know, however, though, within your own Torah, that nothing was made haram for Bani Israel before the Torah. They could eat as they pleased and what they pleased, except for a few things that Israel himself had made haram for himself. Because in the Sharia of Yaqub السلام, it was permissible for a believer to make something haram for themselves and say, I'm going to stay away from this type of food for the sake of Allah Azza wa as an act of worship. That's not allowed in our Sharia. You can't make something haram. You can choose not to eat some stuff because you don't like it or for health reasons or you prefer not to, but you can't make it haram because haram means by eating it, you're sinful. Or if someone else eats it, they're sinful. We don't have that capacity. We can't say, for example, Chocolate is haram in Islam. No, it's not haram. I may choose not to eat it. I may not like chocolate. I may choose to forego chocolate. That's a personal preference. But we don't make it haram. However, in the Sharia of Yaqub it was permissible to do that as an act of worship. And so Yaqub for a certain number of foods, he said, they are haram for me. And that is what Allah Azza wa says, إِلَّا مَا حَرَّمَ إِسْرَائِيلُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ Except that which Israel made unlawful for himself. So everything was allowed. Allah Azza wa says, "Min qabli an tunazzal Torah." This was before the revelation of the Torah, because you know that once the Torah was revealed, a number of things were made haram upon you. So we know, for example, that the Jews are very strict in terms of their food laws when it comes to things like kosher meat and milk and dairy and so. On. They're very strict when it comes to the sorting of their animals and so on. Very strict, and so that's something which Allah Azza wa revealed upon them in the Torah. That changes, abrogates the rulings before the Torah from the other prophets that they accept, that they believe in, because all of us believe in the Prophet Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. So Allah Azza wa is saying that the very claim that you're making, which is leading you to reject the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, this very claim that abrogation cannot exist, is something which you yourselves know can exist because you find it in your own revelation in the Torah. And that is what Allah Azza wa Jalla then says in conclusion to this verse: "Qul fatu bi Torati, fatnuha in kuntum sadiqin." Say to them, bring the Torah and read out the relevant pas- passage if you are telling the truth. The Torah is before you, and that is why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, on a number of occasions, when dealing with people of other religions of Scripture, he would say to them, bring your Scripture before you, because even though there have been distortions and changes made therein, there is still a great deal of evidence that you find therein to show them what is the path which is the truth and that is that they should follow Allah Azza wa Jalla and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that is why in the next verse Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then says فَمَنِ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ those who persist in making up lies and attributing them to Allah Azza wa Jalla after this are the wrongdoers so if you know now that it's possible that it happened, that it's something that you find within your own scriptures to continuously just say the same thing and be obstinate on it is something which shows that you are then insincere, that you're rejecting the truth, that you're ascribing lies to Allah to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you're ascribing lies to your own prophets and messengers alayhim salatu was salam. And so Allah says that that is the sign of oppression. Oppression, arrogance, as the Prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, arrogance is to reject the truth and to look down upon others. Because that is essentially what arrogance leads a person to doing. It leads them to rejecting the truth. And so Allah Azza wa says, فَمَنِ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ You know now that it's possible. You know that other messengers and prophets abrogated rulings because that is what the sharia that Allah Azza wa gave to respective prophets and messengers over time. Then why isn't that the case when it comes to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so therefore that is something which Allah Azza wa refutes in these two verses on the, in Surah Ali Imran. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then in verse number 95 he says, قُلْ صَدَقَ اللَّهِ 
فاتبعوا ملة إبراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين Say indeed Allah speaks the truth so follow Ibrahim's religion he had true faith and he was never an idolater Ibrahim is the Prophet as we said before that all of the people accept the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims we all accept that he was one of the greatest and mightiest of Allah's messengers alayhi salatu wassalam but the difference being is that we believe that Ibrahim salam, only called to Tawheed, didn't call to anything other than the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so therefore his religion is the pristine and true religion of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Islam. And so that is why Allah Azza wa Jal says that you're claiming to follow these messengers and prophets before you, Ibrahim, Ishaq, Ya'qub, Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, and all of these messengers and prophets from that generation, from that time, say, Allah has spoken the truth. Allah has told you the truth in this Quran and Allah Azza wa Jalla has told you the truth of the scripture that came before in the Torah. So now follow the religion of Ibrahim and be true followers of his religion, Hanif and Muslimah, because he was a Muslim who never went astray, a Muslim who never veered from the path and changed or worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ma kana min al He never committed shirk in his life. Allah Azza wa Jal in verse number 96, he then goes on to the, the uh, issue of the construction of the Kaaba and the building of the Kaaba. And he says, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, In awwala baytin wudi'a linnasi lalladhi bi bakkata mubaraka wa hudan lil alameen. The first house of worship to be established for people was the one at Mecca. It is a blessed place, a source of guidance for all people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after speaking about this, the fact that they reject Ibrahim alayhi salam or they reject the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam because of this issue of abrogation and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with it. Allah azza wa jal says, follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam as we know had two children, two sons, Ismail and Ishaq. The Bani Israel chose the path of Ishaq and they followed that path. And that's because Allah azza wa jal sent amongst them as we know many prophets and messengers. However, they ignored the other lineage of Ibrahim السلام, or the other progeny and offspring of Ibrahim السلام, from the line of Ismail السلام. And so Allah Azza wa is saying that this too is from following the religion of Ibrahim. And so you could follow Ismail السلام, meaning by accepting the prophethood of the messenger Muhammad وسلم, and that too would be a culmination of following in the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And so Allah Azza wa Jalla then tells them in this verse something which is important for them, and that is that the first house of worship to be established for people was the one at Mecca. It is a blessed place, a source of guidance for all people. Meaning that what the Prophet وسلم, is bringing is an extension of the message of Ibrahim alayhi salam in the sense that he's following in the same line. Not, not that his sharia are one and the same, but I mean what he's doing is he's bringing the same central message of the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You focused only on one offspring or one side of the offspring of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, but there was another line. And in fact, that line in some ways is more virtuous because the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam is from that line. And also because from that line, they established the first house of worship on the face of earth. That first house of worship it's not Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. It's not Masjid Al-Nabawi in Medina. It's not some other Masjid. It is the one in Mecca that was built by the two Prophets, Ibrahim and Ismail, father and son, alayhim as-salatu wassalam. And the story of the construction of the Kaaba, the raising of its foundation, the way that it was cleansed, the du'as that are made, is something which Allah Azza wa Jalla will mention elsewhere in the Quran. It is spoken about, for example, in Surah Ibrahim. It is spoken about, for example, in Surah Al-Hajj. It is mentioned in some places in the Quran. Here Allah Azza wa Jalla simply gives us a principle. And that principle is being mentioned here in context of what Allah Azza wa Jalla is referring to. And that is that the essence of Ibrahim salam's call is the same as the one that is being brought by our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if you are true adherents, true followers, true people who claim to follow Ibrahim salam, then you would have no issue no hesitation, no reluctance in following the messenger, uh, the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah Azza wa Jalla says that indeed the first house to be established for people was the one in Mecca. And Mecca, as we know, has a number of names in the Arabic language. And from those names is Bekka, the one that is mentioned here in this verse. Bi Bekka Mubaraka. 
and so Mecca and Becca, both of them are names for that holy city, Mubaraka. It is a place. It is, it is a place of blessings, and it is a place of blessings because of the du'as that were made for it by Ibrahim salam. Some of those du'as we already covered in the first juz in Surah Al-Baqarah, in that passage towards the end of the first juz, in which Allah Azza speaks about Ibrahim salam and some of the du'as that he made for the people of Mecca and for the city of Mecca and for the inhabitants of the city of Mecca in terms of their provision and the sanctity of the place and so on and so forth. And so therefore Allah Azzawajal says it is something which is Mubarak and from the greatest evidences of its blessing is that even today after thousands of years from the time of Ibrahim salam, the hearts of millions and millions and millions of Muslims are drawn to that holy city. Go to any Muslim in any part of the world and see how much they yearn to be able to go to Mecca, how much they would love to go to Mecca, how diligently people save and strive for years in order to be able to go to perform Umrah or Hajj, how the people have this amazing love for that city of Allah Azza wa because it is a Mubarak place, a place of blessing and for the people of Mecca, it is a place that is blessed for them also. And it is a source of guidance because that is where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came from. That is where, as we know, the people go for their Hajj and their pilgrimage. That is the place where the religion of Islam began in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is where revelation first came to him and the Quran, its revelation began. And that is what Allah Azza then says in verse number 97. فيه آيات بينات مقام إبراهيم ومن دخله كان آمنا ولله على الناس حج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا ومن كفر فإن الله غني عن العالمين. There are clear signs in it. It is the place where Ibrahim stood to pray. Whoever enters it is safe. Pilgrimage to the house is the duty owed to God. By people who are able to undertake it, those who reject this, then Allah has no need of anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there are many signs in the city of Mecca. And anyone who's been there and has been fortunate enough to go there will see the many signs of Allah Azza wa Jal. And just from reading the story of Ibrahim and Ismail and the mother of Ismail Hajar alayhi salatu was salam, you see the many signs that Allah Azza wa Jal gave to them. The Kaaba, Safa, Marwa, places like Mina, Zamzam, one of these signs that Allah Azza wa gave and from those signs is the Maqam of Ibrahim. The Maqam of Ibrahim is the place that Ibrahim salam stood on or the rock that he stood upon as he was finishing the construction of the Kaaba. As they got higher and higher in the construction of the Kaaba, he needed to stand on a boulder or rock so that he could reach the higher parts of the Kaaba. And the footprints of Ibrahim salam then became fixed within that boulder as a sign for people. That boulder or that rock originally, as we know, would have been next to the Kaaba, would have been more or less joining the Kaaba. And that's how it was for the majority of history from that time onwards until the time of the famous Khalifa Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an. And then he caused it to be moved back to the present place where we find it today. And he caused it to be moved back because as we know, as the Muslims increased in number, more and more people performing pilgrimage, people are making tawaf and other people are trying to pray. And that's a problem even today, to be honest. People are trying to make tawaf and people are trying to pray behind Maqam Ibrahim. And because of the sheer number and volume of people, those two are conflicting somewhat because people are walking past, people are praying, and it becomes problematic. In the time of Umar radiallahu an, he said, we need to move this back slightly, just so that there's enough people for space for people to make tawaf and space for people to pray during that time. And so the Maqam of Ibrahim became a place of prayer. As we know, it is the sunnah after making the tawaf the seven circuits around the Kaaba that you pray two rak'ahs behind Maqam Ibrahim. And in some narrations it is mentioned that this was the uh, one of the inspirations that was given to Umar radiallahu an, that he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, O Messenger of Allah, if only we took this place as a place of prayer and as Allah azza wa jal were mentioned elsewhere in the Quran, Allah gave that command then to take it as a place of prayer, meaning that after the tawaf, it's permissible to pray anywhere in the masjid, by the way, but the best of those places and the one that the Prophet ﷺ chose for his two rak'ahs of tawaf was behind the maqam of Ibrahim. Allah says, وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ آمِنًا Whosoever enters into it, meaning the city of Mecca, will be safe because of the sanctuary of Mecca. It's not allowed to oppress in Mecca, not allowed to 
harry or disturb its its wild animals in order to hunt not allowed to take away its thorn plants or any type of plants or brood them not allowed for example to uh, to take lost property without announcing it all of these different rules that allah Azza wa Jal gave to the city of mecca because of its sacred nature and so likewise the people who enter into it should also be safe and secure وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ And that is what Allah Azza says, Therefore it is an obligation that Allah has placed upon people that they make hajj and pilgrimage to the house. As we know, it is one of the five pillars of Islam. Once in a lifetime, every able Muslim has to be able to go or has to go and perform hajj of the house. And Allah Azza wa says, مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ السَّبِيلَ Whosoever has the ability to do so, meaning primarily the financial ability of having the provisions and being able to get to Mecca and back, those people, it is an obligation upon. If someone doesn't have the ability, they're too poor, they're too destitute, they don't have the wealth, they don't have the money, they don't have the means, then that obligation is lifted from them. However, Hajj is, as we know, one of the greatest pillars of our religion, and the act of Hajj is in itself an amazing act of spirituality, of worship, of coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of seeking forgiveness and repentance, and its rewards are great. And so that's something which we as Muslims shouldn't be laxed concerning. We shouldn't be negligent about. We shouldn't delay and delay and delay for no good reason until we get to a point in our lives when we have no choice or we're too ill or it's difficult but we just don't have a choice anymore and we have to go and perform hajj. Ideally, you want to perform hajj when you are in good health, in good spirits. You have the ability to go and understand and partake in ibadah and to enjoy the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is a moment that should be a life-changing moment in the sense that you come closer to Allah azza wa and you become a better Muslim. Woman kafara and whosoever rejects this, then Allah azza wa is free from such people. In verse number 98, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لِمَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ شَهِيدٌ عَلَى مَا تَعْمَلُونَ Say, O people of the book, why then do you reject Allah's revelations? For indeed Allah Azza wa Jal witnesses everything that you do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially saying that after all of these things that we just mentioned about the issue of abrogation that you find in Torah, about the importance of following Ibrahim alayhi salam, of about how the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is from that line of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa and so on. How can you then believe in these signs and verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you do so, then know that Allah Azza wa is a witness over everything that you do. Meaning the signs are clear. You know them from your own scripture and you know them from what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought. You know that this is the truth. So then if you choose to reject it, then that is something which you will be held to account for on your Mul Qiyamah. In the next verse, verse 99, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لِمَ تَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ تَبَغُونَهَا عِوَجًا وَأَنْتُمْ شُهَدَاءً وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Say, O oh people of the book, why do you turn the believers away from Allah's path and try to make it crooked? When you yourselves should be witnesses to the truth, indeed Allah is not heedless of that which you do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again to the people of the book, not only are you people who disbelieve, you turn away, you reject, but you're trying to prevent others from finding the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're trying to turn away others and be an obstacle for them from seeking guidance from Allah azza wa jal, and you are going and turning away the believers from Allah's path and you try to make it crooked. You change the straight path and try to make it crooked so that people will be led astray and you know yourselves that it is the truth. You are witnesses that it is the truth. And so Allah azza wa jal also speaks about the people of Ahlul Kitab, the people of the scripture, and he admonishes them in this way. And that is because many of them, by knowing, even after knowing the truth, may not necessarily accept it. And so Allah Azza wa speaks to them in this regard. In verse number 100, Allah Azza wa then says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu in tuti'u fariqan min al-ladheena utu al-kitab yaruddukum ba'da imanikum kafirin. O you who believe some of those who were given the scripture would turn you into disbelievers if you were to yield to them. Meaning if they had the ability, despite knowing these signs and these evidences and knowing what is the truth, they would love nothing more that you should turn away from your truth, from the religion of Allah Azza wa and be like them and be from the disbelievers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, In tuti'u fariqa, 
if a group from amongst them had the ability, they could do so, they would make you apostate from your religion after your belief make you turn into disbelievers. And that shows that this is an issue of pride and jealousy. Because if someone was upon the truth and you knew they were upon the truth, why would you want them to be misguided? Why would you want them to be led astray unless it is an issue of jealousy and enmity and hatred and so on? And that is why Allah Azza wa warns us about this. The importance of knowing our own religion, knowing our own theology, knowing what is pleasing to Allah Azza wa is so important for the Muslim because otherwise you can easily be mis- mis- misguided and misled. In the final verse that we'll take today, 101, which is the first page on the next verse, but it is connected, and so we'll speak about that as well. Allah Azza wa says, وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ وَفِيكُمْ رَسُولُهُ وَمَنْ يَعْتَصِمْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ هُدِيَ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ How can you disbelieve when Allah's revelations are being recited to you and His Messenger is living amongst you? Whosoever holds fast to Allah will be guided to the straight path. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says that these people have no excuse. Not only do they not want to believe, they want to harm others and ward off others from the straight path. They want the believers to become disbelievers. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, and how can you do this when you know that these verses that are being recited to you are from Allah? And you can see that this man living amongst you, meaning at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the true messenger of Allah. How can you still disbelieve? And that is what Allah Azza wa Jalla says, but whosoever remains steadfast, holds fast, remains firm upon their religion, despite all of these temptations and all of these issues going on, those are the people that Allah Azza wa Jalla has guided to the straight path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you, me and you from amongst them and keep us firm upon that path. And with that, we come to the end of today's episode. Barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.